This is the Fifth Estate Winning Headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the news you may have missed this morning. We also take a look at some of the political pieces we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 23rd of March, and I am CS. I am JM. And I am Ms. K. Again, in case you missed today's headlines, here they are. Daily Nation, civil servants face pay cuts in July. Mm -hmm. The Standard, Uhuru Raila allies surprise BBI move. And The Star, COVID vaccine scam, rogue staff sell jabs. Oh, what a day. Some depressing news and some interesting mm -hmm. news. What do you have to say about what's happening to William Gruto? Yes, um, today was supposed to be D-Day at uh, Jubilee House. Uh, somebody was supposed to be expelled from the party, but in spite of a decision to stay his uh, Ruto's expulsion uh, from his position in the party, he is not out of the woods yet. In fact, even this strategy to delay is deliberate. Mm -hmm. The approach of the president's men is to drive him into a state of frenzy by keeping him clueless and completely in the dark about his security of tenure. So let me explain this by way of a concept known as gas lighting. This concept was introduced into discourse in the year 1944 in a psychological thriller starring Ingrid Bergman, who played a woman driven into self-doubt by her scheming husband. In this film, the befuddled wife is led to believe that she has misplaced disappearing household objects. She is made to believe that no one else hears the footsteps in the attic and that the gas oilers or the, the gasoliers, that is a chandelier with a gas burner, uh, some old technology there, are dimming only in her mind. And so the spousal mischief causes her to question her own perceptions, her memories, and ultimately her sanity. Gaslighting then is the act of deliberately driving someone crazy by altering their environment and denying their sense of reality. And in this method, uh, Ruto, in this very same method, Ruto will be driven into a state of madness. His memories will be uh, delegitimized and he will become extremely paranoid and unsure even of himself. And then he will make blunder after blunder after blunder. And that is how he will finish himself. Now, there's a saying in Latin that perfectly captures Uhuru Kenyatta's methodology when it comes to dealing with opponents. It says, Sua viter in modo fort it ear in re. In English, that translates to gentle in manner, but unyielding in matter. Mm -hmm. In other words, Usione simba amenyeshewa ukadhani nipaka. Yeah, if you cross Uhuru Kenyatta, the way he deals with you is like one who hides his dagger behind a smile. He will show you outward friendliness, fine words and courteousness. But if your goose is cooked, it is cooked. And the goose of one William Ruto is cooked. Very cooked. Mm. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> Can you smell what the president is cooking? <laughs> <laughs> the standard. What we're looking at are the latest developments on the BBI journey. And as the saints go marching in, the IBC, suffering from another bout of sheer hubris and utter arrogance, is now claiming that one, 17 new proposed constituencies are illegal, and two, that in any event, they would want two years for demarcation or delimitation, as opposed to the proposed six months. In other words, the tail is trying to wag the dog. <laughs> the constitution of Kenya is the supreme law of the land. It is supreme because it is a social contract amongst the peoples of Kenya on how the affairs of the nation shall be conducted. Kenya is sovereign precisely because every foundation and every pillar of this great republic derive their meaning and being from the inherent power of the people. This is why the very first article of the constitution dictates that all sovereign power belongs to the people of Kenya and shall be exercised only in accordance with this constitution. Article 2 goes on to dictate that the constitution is a supreme law of the republic and binds all persons and all state organs at both levels of government. It further stipulates that the very validity or legality of the constitution is not subject to challenge by or before any court or other state organ. This is why in the hierarchy of the laws of our nation, the constitution is supreme. 
It is a constitution by the people which establishes the IABC. It is a constitution by the people which directs parliament to legislate the laws that guide the same IABC. It is the Katiba which establishes the 47 counties and states how many constituencies there shall be. These are things which the people of Kenya gift to themselves. So, if the people of this great republic, in their wisdom, wish to exercise their sovereign power and give themselves 70 more constituencies mm -hmm. and further direct that this be done in six months, then someone please help me understand from which corner of Siberia are Mr. Chebukati and half a commission reading the constitution. Half a commission. Once the amendments pass, they become part of the supreme law. Parting short, I smell a smelly stinking rat. The current version of the draft amendment bill has been available since October of last year. Why has it taken six months, mm. half a year, for the IABC to read two lines in the BBI that they are now taking issue with? Tafadali, do not carry us pumpkin. Mositubebe <laughs> malenge. <laughs> Do not carry us pumpkin. On the start today, we are engaging in a bit of speculation about a new scandal in the offing concerning COVID vaccines. Apparently, some rogue health facilities have been administering the COVID-19 vaccine to people not eligible for phase one priority list. The priority list. Mm -hmm. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Anyway, CS Health CS Mutahi Kagwe said that drastic measures will be taken on these facilities. But I'd like to give the CS a story on corruption. It's about a snake that used to stick, sneak into a farmer's farm and swallow his eggs. Mm. It would squeeze itself through a narrow opening in the fence and head for the chicken pen. Then it would swallow an egg and quickly retreat. However, on its way out, it found it difficult to squeeze through the narrow opening of the fence mm. because its stomach would be swollen. But this was a witty snake and it would slither its way and twist and slap its stomach against the fence mm. to break the shell of the egg inside. And once the shell cracked, the stomach shrunk and the snake would squeeze out and gleefully head out into the wild. So the farmer tried to catch the snake for months, but he decided to change tact. He boiled an egg and he left that egg in an obvious place for the snake to swallow. And as expected, the snake slithered in, swallowed the egg and headed out. Now, when he got to that narrow hole in the fence, he repeated what he always did. He slapped his swollen stomach and twisted around to break the shell of the egg. But the egg was hard as a rock and would mm. not break. And without a lot of effort, the farmer strolled in to where the snake was stuck and killed it. Now, CS, maybe you should change tact. Instead of chasing the slithering snakes in your ministry from Kemsa billionaires to now COVID defaulters, just boil the yeah. egg. <laughs> That's a smart approach. It is. We have a yeah. three-part criteria that we use to judge the headlines for you. We ask ourselves three questions. Is the headline thoughtful, tropical or speculative, repetitive or groundbreaking, thoughtful or just plain lazy? And I think that I'm... There's none of these headlines that meet our criteria particularly, therefore we are going to toss them all in mm. quick succession. Yeah. Onto the political pieces we call cartoons in this country, just like the headlines, we have a three-part criteria. We used to break down the cartoons for you. We ask ourselves, are they humorous or dry, satirical or pessimistic and effective or just plain lazy? And as a team, we have looked through the cartoons of this day and they are mostly pessimistic, especially the star. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're going to award the winning cartoon to the Daily Nation, where we have a caricature of Deputy President William Ruto trying to fix his wheelbarrow. And we must note that his wheelbarrow is very, very UDA yellow. Yes. And it also has a square wheel instead of a round one. And he's working so hard to fix it and it's full 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 of his camp from the Sudis of this world to the Murkomens and they are all just sitting looking at him while he struggles mm. and I think that is our winning cartoon <laughs> on to our final thought but before we get there don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification button yeah this week um, final thought we are looking at famous trials that change the world and today we look at the trial of Jesus the Christ of Nazareth against the Sanhedrin. Um, trial of Jesus merits analysis for the simple reason that no other trial in human history has significantly affected the course of human events like that of Jesus. 
The Gospels tell us of the arrest of Jesus, how he was taken to the house of the high priest, accused and found guilty. Now, as a historical text, one of the fascinating things about the Bible is that it has numerous external references which speak to the historicity of the events in Scripture. Mm. For instance, the famed and revered Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, writing in the 80s or early 90s AD, indicated that both Jewish leaders and the Romans played roles in the crucifixion of Jesus. Mm. Josephus tells us that about the same time they lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a performer of marvelous feats and a teacher of such men who received the truth with pleasure. He attracted many Jews and many Greeks. He was called the Christ. Pilate sentenced him to die on the cross, having been urged to do so by the noblest of our citizens. Mm. But those who loved him at the first did not give up their affection for him. And the tribe of the Christians who are named after him have not disappeared to this day. Indeed. Now, the noblest citizens that Josephus was talking about were the Sanhedrin, who are mm. referred to in the other Gospels, including Mark. Mm. But who were the Sanhedrin? This was the highest ruling council of the Jews. There were 70 members, mostly made up of Sadducees, Pharisees, and priests, plus the leader who was the high priest. There are various accounts of the origin of the Sanhedrin and their evolution. Arguably, they were established as early as the time of the founding of the Levitical priesthood. We see this in the book of Numbers, um, when uh, 70 men are told to be brought by God to Moses. Mm. The Sanhedrin were a theocratic body, and so the crimes for which he was tried, Jesus that is, were for breaking Jewish law, and they gave a myriad of reasons for putting the Christ to trial. Mm. Most notably, they found him guilty of blasphemy, claiming that he was God's son That's and the right. awaited Messiah. Mm. During the time of Jesus, the Sanhedrin was still allowed to exist under Roman rule, but their power was limited. Yes. They could find a person guilty and give the death sentence, but they could not carry it out. Only mm. the Romans could put a person to death, which is why the Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. The Sanhedrin had in place a number of rules also regarding the conduct of their own trials, but during this trial, they contravened their own rules. For example, very quickly, a trial could not take place at night or during the time of an important festival. Jesus was arrested late on Thursday night after the Passover meal. That's right. Secondly, the death penalty could not be passed immediately if a person was found guilty. The Sanhedrin, however, had to wait. Uh, uh, the, the trial of Jesus, however, was um, conducted in haste. They mm. wanted him tried and eliminated as quickly, quickly as possible. As possible. Yeah. All trials had to take place in the Hall of Hewn Stones, the official palace for trials located in the temple. But this trial took place in the house of the high mm -hmm. priest. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting fact uh, as I conclude this introduction about the Sanhedrin. Some historians argue that Gamaliel, who was one of the greatest teachers of that generation, was seated amongst them. It is also said that Gamaliel was a teacher of Paul, the apostle, before his Damascene conversion. Mm. So in this way, we see a fascinating tapestry in the persecution and passion of the Christ and the man who would later take the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Mm. Very, mm. very interesting there. I nice. didn't know that the Sanhedrin had history all the way back to numbers. Numbers, yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But I have a question. Why was there a trial and not an assassination? I mean, the chief priests and the Sanhedrin had arrived in the garden mm. with a gang of people. They were armed with swords and clubs. They even cut off someone's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. And Jesus' disciples all forsook him. They fled. So why did the arresting party not execute Jesus right away in the Garden of Gethsemane? Mm -hmm. If Jesus had been executed there, the people would have wakened up to a strange mystery of the disappearance of Jesus. Why go through the process of a trial? Why mm. not just finish that story and we would never have heard of it? Mm. But the answer is in the Sanhedrin's interpretation of their own laws. They say that if death comes by assassination, then the one who kills is guilty before the law and the one who is killed is innocent. The chief priests don't want to be in that position. But if death is a result of a judicial process, then the one who is killed is guilty before the law and the ones who kill are innocents. That's what the priests want. Mm. Jesus condemned as a guilty lawbreaker while they stand as the righteous upholders of the law of God. Mm. They needed the judicial process to validate them and their judgment of Jesus. In my view, the trial of Jesus was not justice. As a Christian, it was the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of the world, but it was a legal process. And this is why 
when the court was convened, they brought out witnesses. That is find this in Matthew 25, from 59 to 60. And I quote, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though, many, though they had many witnesses, false, false witnesses came forward. Mm. And the problem with the witnesses was that they contradicted each other. <laughs> Mark says that many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Mm. And just like in a trial of our day, a judgment was issued. Mm. Death by crucifixion. Mm. And as C.S. has rightly said, the Jews could make this judgment, but they could not execute. And that's why Jesus went through two trials. Yes. One under Caiaphas, the yes. high priest, yes. and a second under Pontius Pilate in his residence. And mm. he, Pontius Pilate, is the one who in the end made the determination that Jesus should be hung. Mm. And after he'd done a deal, he did a deal to bring mm. out Barabbas. Mm. Anyway, I will leave you with this interesting fact. Within six years of the crucifixion of, crucifixion of Jesus, as a different governor, Vitilius, removed both Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pontius Pilate from their roles in the Jewish um, a community, if I could say that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Rome ordered Pontius Pilate back and the, <laughs> with complaints of excessive cruelty, mm -hmm. which led to him actually exiling in Vienne in France. Mm -hmm. France, yeah. And so uh, let me just pick up from that and talk about the different reasons why the Romans uh, wanted him dead, why the Jews actually wanted him dead first, but also why he posed a threat uh, to the Roman Empire. Um, the Pharisees hated Jesus because he criticized and exposed their hypocrisy. The Sadducees hated him uh, because he turned over the table of the money changers, for example, and chased uh, all these traders out of the temple. Uh, and, and do you know, by the way, that there was a whole uh, a network there, a symbiotic relationship between these um, uh, traders at the, at the temples and, 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 and the priests and the Sadducees? Mm -hmm. They got a cut. Uh, from the money changes. So Jesus was bad for business, in addition to uh, being blasphemous. But the Romans were also keen to have him die. Uh, and that's because we're always suspect of Jewish messiahs, because all Jewish messiahs, even before Jesus, uh, were nationalists. They were freedom fighters who killed Roman soldiers and tried to overthrow them. You will recall uh, a few months ago, we had a book that we reviewed uh, on the messiahs. Uh, and, and, you know, this whole idea of, of a savior. Um, and we've got to remember at this time, uh, the nation of Israel was under uh, occupation, uh, much like the way Kenya was under occupation uh, by the British Empire. So there was always a struggle uh, f on their part to try and liberate themselves from, uh, from colonial dominance. So Jesus was a threat um, to the empire, to the Roman Empire, since you know he was perceived as being somebody who would stoke insurrection amongst the Jews to rebel against the empire. Uh, but all that having been said, Pontius Pilate, we see uh, in, in, in the book, was not ready to kill Jesus because Jesus had not killed any Roman soldiers and he was not really giving Rome a very hard time yet. Uh, but we're told that uh, by, by analysts um, that uh, Pontius Pilate knew he had to cooperate with the Sanhedrin uh, or the Sanhedrin might turn against Rome and he needed to keep the peace so that Rome could continue to collect taxes uh, without spending money on wars in this region of Judea. So in sum, peace was you know, better um, than uh, uh, you know, then, then probably going into a situation where uh, war uh, would have ended up occurring. Um, and, and, and here what we see is that regardless of whether the Jews or the people in the city of Jerusalem demanded that he be crucified, uh, you know, despite even having no legal authority for his crucifixion, mm -hmm. uh, Pontius Pilate, for the sake of keeping peace in the empire and keeping peace in that region, uh, just agreed uh, to have the Sanhedrin carry the day with whatever decision that they had uh, wanted. Um, and it's no surprise that he was exiled uh, to France, or he exiled himself, because, you know, this was a really tough time domestically with the local politics going on, all the wars going on amongst 
um, the, 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 the Jews, uh, the followers of Christ, uh, and, and you know, them trying to liberate themselves from Roman occupation. Uh, yeah, so this is a very, very, very interesting uh, trial. And it's a trial indeed that changed the world, and then we still talk about. We still talk indeed, about. Indeed, it's fascinating uh, because we see that tension in the fact that um, Pontius Pilate did have questions. And one of my favorite questions that he asked uh, Jesus when he was in front of him mm -hmm. is uh, he asked Jesus, what is truth? He looked yes. into the eyes of truth, the what embodiment truth? of truth. And asked Jesus, philosophical question. Yes, what is very, truth? very philosophical. <laughs> There's a song I know that says, when that question is asked, they answer that truth was standing right in front of them. For Jesus is the way, the truth, Precisely. and the life. Yeah. Anyway, wow. let me end on this quote. Um, the law was made for one thing alone, a legal mm. quote, for the exploitation of those who don't understand it. Mm. This is a quote by Berthold Brecht, some German guy. Mm. <laughs> Enjoy that and think on that. Today we had no winning headline, but we had a winning cartoon from the Daily Nation. Do enjoy your day.